Good evening. As some of you might know, over the past several weeks, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, which represents 100,000 members and 710 member clubs across Ontario, our partners at the Canadian Sport Fishing Industry Association, which represents retailers across Canada from the smallest tackle shop to major stores like Canadian Tire, and the Federation of Ontario Cottage Associations, which represents 500 cottage associations, have been holding a series of public meetings on the Algonquin land claim. This webcast is an extension of those meetings and is designed to provide anybody across the province with an interest in the land claim or who may be affected by the claim with information and the means of letting the government know where you stand on the issue. In large part, we organized these meetings in response to the complete failure of the provincial and federal governments to consult with a wide range of affected parties, including the 1.4 million people who live and work in the area of the claim. Recently, the provincial and federal governments struck out on their own traveling roadshow, which despite being billed as public information sessions, provided little in the way of new information and failed to answer a lot of the questions that people have about the claim, the agreement in principle, and what it will mean for them in the future. This lack of consultation before making decisions and the lack of answers since making those decisions is characteristic of the way in which this whole process has been conducted. Our purpose in being here this evening is to provide you with information to do the best we can to answer some of your questions and to suggest some of the ways in which you can make your voices heard on this issue. We will be anxious after this webcast to hear your views, to get your feedback, and to hear what you think about what's been negotiated on by the two levels of government on your behalf, because don't forget, that's who they're negotiating for. I want to be clear from the start, however, that we're not disputing the validity of this land claim, nor are we disputing the fact that First Nations in Canada, in this case the Algonquin First Nations, have special rights under Section 35 of the Constitution. At the same time, we also believe that the 1.4 million non-Aboriginals and the 8,000 Algonquin who live, work and recreate in the land claim area uh, deserve to have their governments negotiate on their behalf in good faith and in the best interests of everyone and that they will arrive at an agreement and an eventual treaty that is fair to everyone. Unfortunately, the process to date has been anything but fair and has evolved, involved an appalling lack of transparency and a consistent failure to consult with all of the effective parties, most notably you, the general public. The land claim involves two major steps. The first is an agreement in principle, which has already been negotiated and released in December of last year. This contains the foundation for an eventual treaty, which will be the legally binding document that will give force to what's been agreed to. I ask you to keep in mind how the claim will impact on the activities that you currently enjoy, your livelihood, your access to property, access to valuable natural resources, the conservation of those resources for current and future generations, and the impact on local businesses, on municipalities, and others. To our knowledge, all of the lands and waters within the claim are used in some way by Ontario residents. This is not some remote northern agreement. This is a fully occupied, fully utilized landscape. This should not be surprise, surprising given that 1.4 million Ontario residents live within the claim area and probably just as many people visit the area each year. For instance, Algonquin Park has 800,000 visitors every year. At the outset of the negotiation process, the two governments, and in particular the province, developed a set of principles on which these negotiations would be based. For our purposes, the most important of these is the commitment to consult with interested parties throughout the negotiation process and to keep the public informed about the progress of those negotiations. Now, I don't know about you, but in our view, not only have the two levels of government failed to deliver, but their idea of consultation is sadly misinformed. Instead, they've negotiated an agreement, which the chief provincial negotiator has admitted will not change substantially without that promised public consultation. Before I turn the meeting over to first Matt DeMille, Assistant Manager of Fish and Wildlife Services for the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, I want to point out that a wealth of material, some of which you will hear referenced today, is available on this website, www.algonquinlandclaim.ca, including fact sheets, maps, form letters, presentations, and other material that Matt and the other speakers will reference. At the end of the day, the negotiators for all three parties have reached an agreement in principle. The governments have negotiated on behalf of the people of Ontario, but along the way, forgot to keep you informed and forgot to ask you what your views were. 
Changes to the AIP will not be made unless people uh, speak out and get to their elective representatives and urge them to make changes. For municipalities, changes will not come unless there's a concerted effort to work together to bring pressure to bear on the governments. People throughout the land claim area are only now waking up to what this might mean for them in the future. I welcome you to this webcast this evening. Thank you for listening and hope that this will provide you with information and answers that will give you some comfort, some direction, and some idea of what it is that we're dealing with and the scope of this AIP. Thank you for being with us. I'd now like to turn the proceedings this evening over to Matt DeMille. Matt is the Assistant Manager of Provincial Fish and Wildlife Services for the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. Matt? Thank you, Greg. Uh, as Greg said, my name is Matt DeMille and I am the Assistant Manager of Fish and Wildlife Services with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. In December, the Algonquin Land Claim Agreement and Principle was released. Now, Greg described a little bit about what that is. We'll provide you in this presentation a little bit more background. We'll provide you some information on what that could mean for you and also on what you can do about it. So the Algonquin Land Claim covers a large area. And as you can see from the map, it's 36,000 square kilometers. And that's 8.9 million acres. Now, this is a settled landscape. There are a number of people living here. There's private lands, there's crown lands, there's a mix of land uses. And in the Algonquin Land Claim Agreement in principle, it was negotiated by three parties, the Ontario government, the federal government, and the Algonquins of Ontario. And this has been negotiated over the past 20 years. And during that time, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters has had some goals for the land claim and the negotiation process. For all residents of Ontario, we wanted to maintain public fish and wildlife conservation management. We wanted to maintain public fishing and hunting opportunities. We wanted to maintain access to those public fishing and hunting opportunities. But most of all, we wanted to maintain our culture, our heritage, our way of life, and our quality of life. So what does the Algonquin Land Claim mean for the public lands and waters within the Algonquin Land Claim region? Well, what we know is that public lands will become private lands. The agreement in principle states that no less than 117,500 acres of public land will be transferred to the Algonquins. And that's made up of 200 parcels ranging in size from a few acres to over 30,000 acres. And if you look at the map, you can see that these are some of the parcels within the Algonquin land claim region. And we know that existing public land users will be displaced when these lands are transferred. But it's not just the lands, it's also the public lakes. We know that public lakes will become private lakes. So if you look at the picture, uh, the map that's on the screen, you can see a large parcel. This is a parcel just south of Algonquin Park. It's 18,000 acres, over 18,000 acres. And there are a number of lakes, rivers, and streams wholly encompassed within that parcel. Now this becomes an issue because the beds of lakes and rivers will become privatized under the Algonquin Land Claim Agreement in principle. And we also have a recent issue of the federal government changing navigation laws, so the rules and regulations that allow the public to navigate waters to access them for recreation. Those laws have changed so the future is uncertain for how we'll be able to access the lakes and rivers and streams within the Algonquin Land Claim region. But we also have legislation that's intended to protect our use of public land, and that's the Public Lands Act. And in that act, it actually says that 25% of existing public waterfront acreage should be set apart for recreational and access purposes. But when we look at the lands that are being transferred through the Algonquin land claim, we see that at least 86% or 86 water bodies, sorry, are no longer, do no longer satisfy this law. So it's also about the features that are on the landscape. So you can tell where the lakes and rivers are and you know where the lands are that are being transferred. But sometimes it's important to look at what features and values are on those landscape because those are important for the people within this region or who use this region. And as you can see from the map, this is the same picture of uh, a parcel that's being transferred south of Algonquin Park. And you can see that there's eight lakes that are publicly stocked within this area. They're stocked with brook trout, they're stocked with rainbow trout, and they're stocked with splake. Now these are publicly funded stocking 
uh, st stocking exercises within this region. What's going to happen? Are they still going to be stocked? Are they going to be uh, publicly funded? We don't know what the future of public stocking in these, on these transferred lands and in these transferred lakes will be. But it's not just about the lakes and it's not just about the lands, but it also could be about the lands that are adjacent to those that are being transferred. We know that within these lands, there's going to be critical access points. And as you can see from the map, there's boat launches, there's boat access areas, there's public access roads. These are critical access points for the adjacent crown lands, not just the lands that are being transferred, but much larger parcels of land. And it's critical for the people who use these lands to have these access points. We don't know what the future of those critical access points will be. Public land is also going to become provincial park. So it's not just the 117,000 acres that's going to be transferred as private land, but public lands are also going to be, uh, the, the land use designation will be changed from crown land to provincial park. Now, although we can still access provincial parks and use provincial parks, our use of those provincial parks will be fundamentally changed from the way they were on crown lands. There will be prohibitions, there will be restrictions, there will be changes to the way that we use those lands. Now, as you can see from the map, this is the largest provincial park that's being proposed through the land claim, and it's over 30,000 acres. If you add that to the 117,500 acres that's being transferred from crown land to private land, we're getting up towards 150,000 acres of land within the Algonquin land claim region that will be fundamentally changed through this agreement in principle. But it's not just about new provincial parks. There are a large number of existing provincial parks within the land claim area, 55 in total, and 16 of those parks will now be jointly managed by Algonquins of Ontario and the Ontario government. And we don't know what's going to happen with this co-management of these provincial parks, and we don't know what's going to happen with the remaining 39 that aren't going to be co-managed. So there's still a lot of uncertainty surrounding the way we'll be able to use provincial parks within the land claim region. So just to summarize, we know that public lands will become private lands. We know that public lakes will become private lakes. We know that publicly stocked lakes will become private lakes. And we know that some remaining public lands may become restricted. We know that public lands will become provincial parks and we know that existing provincial parks will change in the way that we can use them. But so far I've been talking about the average everyday person going out to use crown lands. But what we also have within the Algonquin land claim region is what the government calls legal interest on those public lands. And what we know through this process is that many of these people who have legal interest on public lands in the Algonquin land claim region are going to now have to negotiate their future with their new Algonquin landlords when the parcels are transferred. So this will be true for people with land use permits. That could be for crown land hunt camps or cottages. Crown land leases, licenses of occupations, trap lines, bear management areas, and bait harvest areas. The future for all of those interests is uncertain. Now if we look at that same parcel again south of Algonquin Park, we see that there are a large number of legal interest in those lands. There's six recreational camp land use permits, there's one commercial outpost camp land use permit, three active trap lines, three active bear management areas, and one bait harvest area. And so those are the legal interests on top of those everyday people that are going in fishing, hunting, camping, canoeing, kayaks. There's a lot of people using individual parcels. So we've talked about what the land transfers will mean for the Algonquin land claim, but what will the Algonquin land claim mean for fish and wildlife management within the region? So what we know from the agreement in principle of the Algonquin land claim is that fish and wildlife resources will now need to reach a crisis, crisis point before management is considered. This is fundamentally different from what we know. As non-Algonquins in this region, we have a comprehensive set of rules and regulations that we follow for fishing and hunting. We have seasons, we have size limits, we have harvest limits, we have a science-based process and system of rules and regulations that we follow that manage our fish and wildlife resources, not only for now, but for future generations to enjoy. But what we see with wild fish and wildlife resources now needing to reach a crisis point, that this has created a separate management system for Algonquins and non-Algonquins. 
So this system of fish and wildlife management is key to the conservation of our fish and wildlife resources in Ontario. And it's been that way for more than 100 years. So we don't understand why you would want to change that now. So a little more specifically for fishing, we know that the future quantity of public fishing opportunities will decline. There's going to be less lakes available to the public. But what we're not sure about is how the quality of those remaining public fishing opportunities will be. We also don't know what the fate of our unique and sensitive Algonquin Park brook trout lakes is going to be, and we don't know what the fate of des our designated lake trout lakes are going to be. And this will all hinge on what happens with the transfer of these lands and what development occurs. For hunting, we know that the Algonquin land claim could mean that there's fewer elk tags available for non-Algonquin hunters. We know that public deer yards will now become private property. We know that some public wetlands will become private property. And we also know that fewer bull and cow moose tags will be available for, or may be available for non-Algonquin hunters. So this is something I'd like to talk a little bit more about. So if you look at the graph on the screen, you can see that over the past decade or so that there's been a steady increase in the demand for adult moose tags by Algonquin harvesters. And this is important because if we look at the same, if we look at the same region and we look at non-Algonquin hunters, we see that there's a large demand for these tags. So if you look at the map, you can see the wildlife management units outlined in red. And for each wildlife management unit, it has a number in brackets. And that number represents the number of adult male our adult male or female moose tags that are given out to non-Algonquin hunters divided by the number of people who applied for those tags. So if the number is 13, for example, like 63A, then you can see that there's 13 people apply for every one moose tag that's given out. So there's a lot of demand there. And this is important because if the Algonquin demand is increasing and there's no more moose or there's less moose, that means that we're going to see less moose tags available for non-Algonquin hunters. So again, we know that non-Algonquin, non-Algonquins will lose public lands, public lakes, and publicly stocked lakes. But they could lose access to remaining public lands and lakes. They could lose public land hunt camps, public land bait harvest areas, public land bear management areas, public land trap lines, and even the White Lake fish hatchery which the Algonquins, through the Agreement of Principle, now have first right of refusal. So if we spend a little bit more time talking about the White Lake Fish Culture Station, we start to see how important it is. We see that the, White Lake, the, the fish that are produced at the White Lake Fish Culture Station stock lakes throughout southern Ontario. And they stock almost a million fish. And if we look at that provincially, that accounts for more than 10% of the MNR's total fish production for stocking in public waters every year. If we no longer have the White Lake fish hatchery and we no longer have that production, where's that production going to come from? Are the lakes that it stocks still going to be stocked? What's going to happen? We don't know. The future is uncertain, but this is a big issue moving forward. We've been talking about uncertainty. There's additional uncertainties, not just with what's in the Algonquin Land Claim Agreement in principle, but what could be coming next. If you look at the map, you can see that there's over a number of overlapping land fishing and hunting claims within the Algonquin Land Claim region. You can see that the Williams Treaty overlaps with the Algonquin Land Claim, and this is important because the Williams Treaty is now back in the courts where the signatory bands, seven signatory bands of the Williams Treaty are now trying to get their hunting and fishing rights uh, reestablished that were given up in the 1923 treaty. Also, the Algonquins of Quebec so in the communities of Tamiskaming, Wolf Lake, and Eagle Village also have overlapping land claims with the Algonquin land claim region. And that's not to mention the Métis Nation of Ontario who are also trying to assert harvesting rights within this region. So we know what's, gonna, what's coming within the agreement in principle, but what we don't know is what's coming next. So based on this, we have a number of questions. And the first is, why were you not consulted? For each parcel of public land that's going to be transferred, were current users asked before now how they will be impacted by the privatization of this land? And what evaluation was done of the alternatives? But the most important thing 
is if the government was negotiating on your behalf, then what did they take to the table? If they didn't talk to you, what did they bring to those negotiations to determine what areas should go as land settlements in this Algonquin land claim? The next question is, has the, the land claim created injustices? Well, Chief Negotiator told the OFH, we are not here to displace people. There's a statement of shared objectives that was prepared wherein there's a commitment by the Algonquin people not to expropriate anybody's interest. That means people are not going to lose their rights. We also see that a Chief Negotiator told the OFH, we're not going to interfere with the hunt camps. So why then have hunt camps received a letter from the MNR stating that we have determined that your recreation camp is on Crown land that may be transferred to the Algonquins of Ontario in the future. It went on to say, the purpose of this letter is to inform you of the proposed transfer of Crown land to the Algonquins of Ontario. The Algonquins will negotiate agreements for hunt camps with those holding Crown land use permits for hunt camps. But the chief negotiator told that we are not going to interfere with the hunt camps. This letter would suggest differently. The next question we have is, have the objectives guiding the land selection process been satisfied? Well, then the question would be, how does the privatization of 200 parcels of public land, which is more than 117,000 acres, satisfy the objective to respect the existing interests of the public and to provide for future public needs and interests? How does it satisfy the objective to recognize the important role of lands under the administration and control of Ontario and Canada for the cultural, economic, and social fabric of Ontario? And how does it satisfy the objective to conserve the wildlife and biological productivity of the land? So based on these questions, we have some concerns. And obviously our first concern is the public consultation up until this point has been in inadequate. We know that the agreement in principle creates injustices for non-Algonquin Ontario residents because it does not consider the public's needs and interests, it will displace people, it will create new access restrictions, and it does not uphold laws such as the Public Lands Act, the Ontario Environmental Assessment Act, and the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act. These are all laws that are intended to protect the people of Ontario and conserve our fish and wildlife resources. So hopefully we've given you some information on what this could mean for you, and what this Algonquin land claim is. But now we want to tell you what you can do. And the first thing is you can always learn more. So you can use our website, www.algonquinlandclaim.ca to get more information. And as you can see on the left-hand side, uh, there's a number of links that you can follow for background information, to look at maps, to get fact sheets, form letters, questionnaires, and some of the presentations that have been made on the Algonquin land claim. But keep checking back to make sure that you can get the most up-to-date information because we'll be adding information as it becomes available. But what we want you to do is we want you to express how the land claim affects you. In 2007, the Ontario Minister of Environment produced a declaration order that said the Ontario government must determine and assess the impacts of the Algonquin land claim on you but they need your information to do so. And so far, if they haven't consulted you, what information do they have? You need to make sure you get that information to them. And the way to do that is to determine how the land claim affects you. So take a look at the maps that are on the website and by each of the red sections of the map, the red parcels, they will have a parcel ID number. And this is important because this will be the descriptor to know which parcel that you're referring to. So you identify that parcel number, but also why, that, why is that parcel important to you? So we've created a form, which you can see in the bottom right hand of the screen, where you can fill out your name and contact information, put in the parcel identification number, and then check the boxes for how you use this parcel of land. So fill out the sheets, and then make sure you send them to us. Send them to um, OFH at OFH.org or send them to uh, our address, which is provided on the, the form screen there. You can also view the descriptive plans. So by these maps, you're not gonna get the detailed information that's gonna tell you uh, much about them. You're just gonna see them on the larger map. 
But what you can do is you can actually book an appointment by contacting the information, uh, the Ontario Information Centre, which the contact information is at the bottom of the screen. And you can actually book an appointment to view these plans. And these plans uh, could be for the settlement lands, for uh, specified Algonquin lands, areas of Algonquin's interest, uh, county forest lands, the White Lake facility and its lands. And this will give you more information on the current uses and activities of those lands, particularly the, particularly the legal interest, but also show you roads, trails, uh, easements, and tell you uh, what the intentions for each of the parcels of those lands will be. But you also need to make sure that you let the government know, that you tell your elected representatives how you're feeling and how this impacts you. And, and on our website, we have form letters to the Premier of Ontario and to the Prime Minister. And that'll give you some idea, but feel free to personalize, make your own letters and send them in, but please copy us on them. Also let your member of provincial parliament know, your member of parliament, and make sure you provide your concerns to your municipality. Make sure that you let your elected representatives at each level of government know how this impacts you and why this is important, why they should get involved on your behalf. And for all of your concerns, as I said, please make sure you send us a copy. So remember, we live, we work, and we recreate within the Algonquin land claim area. This impacts us all. Make your voice heard. Our next speaker this evening will be Mr. Phil Morlock. Uh, Phil represents the Canadian Sport Fishing Industry Association and Shimano Canada. I'd now like to have Phil uh, address the audience. Good evening. I'm Phil Morlock, representing the Canadian Sport Fishing Industry Association. We represent the manufacturers, the retailers, the sales agencies coast to coast in Canada who bring recreational fishing products to the over 8 million Canadians who enjoy fishing. We've been involved in the Algonquin land claim process for close to 20 years. We've been at the table in discussions from when the process began back in the Bob Ray administration in Ontario, through the Mike Harris government and on into present day. So we've been around it for a long time. We've seen the revolving door of negotiators come and go. And one thing has held clear throughout the entire process, and that's been the importance of jobs and economy in the Algonquin land claim region in Eastern Ontario. Recreational fishing is big business in Canada. It's over $8 billion annual impact. Over 8 million Canadians of all ages and backgrounds fish. And an important part of this is that the people that buy our products and that enjoy recreational fishing tend to be people that also hunt and also vote. They show up at the polls. More people in Canada enjoy fishing than play golf and hockey combined. Canadians spend as much every year fishing as they do buying beer. Everybody always laughs at that figure, but it's true. Recreational fishing supports a number of other economies or is connected to other economies, such as tourism, boats, vehicles that pull the boats, ATV, snowmobiling, and so on. Any of you who fish probably realize that the equipment that you have, the trips that you take, also benefit other jobs, other people that earn a living from a healthy resource, from the fishery. Fishing in Ontario is pretty important on the national stage in Canada. It's 46% of the national market and over $4 billion annually. And Eastern Ontario is a major component of the national market in recreational fishing in this country. Government often counts license sales in a given year, but we count customers. If you're going to be in business, you have to know the size of the market that you're selling into. And that's how we know that there are over 8 million people in this country. If they were asked the question, do you fish, the answer would be yes. They come from all backgrounds, all walks of life, men, women, boys, girls, all abilities, all political persuasions. Anybody that enjoys fishing is probably somebody that walks in the door of some of the stores that we represent and buy products that manufacturers make for fishing. In the Algonquin land claim region, recreational fishing is a pretty important component as well. According to the federal statistics, 
Just under $700 million a year is generated by recreational fishing and related economies in the Algonquin land claim region. That's about one-seventh of the land base of Ontario. We support over 8,200 jobs and it's a major destination for tourism, Algonquin Park especially, but also well beyond that. People come from all across North America and the world to fish in that area. The basis of the economy of recreational fishing is pretty simple. Without healthy fish and wildlife populations, people don't go fishing, they don't go hunting, and they don't go uh, into the stores to buy the products that we manufacture. The basis of a science-based natural resource management, harvest limits, environmentally sustainable use that Matt spoke about earlier are critical to the basis of the jobs and economy that recreational fishing has. Also the access to public lands and water. If people can't reach the water to fish, they can't fish. Pretty straightforward. And the law enforcement that goes around it for those that would violate conservation principles, the rules and regulations and the enforcement that make sure that that's looked after are also critical to us. I think it's fair to say that the most important aspect though is responsible government policy with conservation as a priority. Conservation has not been a priority in this land claim process. It's become a punchline. It's been referred to many times by the negotiators as being important, but when you read the document itself, especially chapter eight, the harvest chapter in the agreement in principle, it's pretty clear that conservation is an afterthought. And Supreme Court rulings that have dealt with First Nation issues and harvest of fish and wildlife and all natural resources have always made sure to say that conservation is the cornerstone and going forward, that's the responsibility of government. That has been set aside in this process. So from the business community, we often take a look at what do we get? What's the return on investment? You spend money, there's two ways to spend money. You can spend it as an expense, you can spend it as an investment. So after 20 years in this process and over $20 million that Ontario and Canada have spent in this, take a look at what we've seen as the return on investment. There's a lot of government spin going on right now with some of the meetings that they've had with press interviews by the uh, negotiators from all three parties and so on. But there's the public relations campaign and then there's the actual fact of the matter that we've seen firsthand. Matt referred to the statement of shared objectives that all three entities signed, Ontario, Canada, and the Algonquin First Nation. They talked about the importance of continuing to consult with interested parties. They talked about avoiding creating injustices for anyone in this process through the negotiations and so on. They agreed to this twice, 1994 and more recently in 2006. But that's not really how it played out. For years we were told by both Canada and Ontario and our colleagues at OFAH and other interested parties, we were told that there was no progress in the negotiations, essentially due to internal problems the Algonquins were having, trying to determine who their membership was and, and so on. And for that reason there was really nothing to consult with us about. I've never really been clear on how, where the negotiations stood or didn't had anything to do with consulting with the stakeholder community. Nonetheless, that's what we were told. We were told by both governments. Sorry, really nothing to talk to you about. Then more recently, in 2011, when things started to move forward, we were told that they couldn't really talk to us because the negotiations were confidential and so, sorry, we can't speak to specifics because we'll violate the confidentiality negotiation. Now if that sounds like a contradiction, we would agree with that. And so that example in many ways exemplifies what has taken place over the 20 years in this process. We're told one thing, ask to stand by, we'll get around to talking to you, and then when it comes time to do that, that doesn't happen. It hasn't happened with the public either, Matt spoke to that. How many of you have actually been asked, what do you think? How many of you have been showed 
a map, for example, and said, well, we're considering changing the access to these areas, to these lakes, to these lands. Will that affect you? We often hear that the Algonquins want to be good neighbors. I would suggest that good neighbors ask first before they make decisions, before they roll them out. And I'd leave it to you to answer the question, if you spend any time in eastern Ontario, or if you live there, have you been asked? Has there been any opportunity for you to give that input? I'd also point out that the chief negotiator for Ontario, Brian Crane, is on the record at a meeting with many of us last summer saying that once the agreement in principle was made public, there would be no changes possible. Few, if any, I believe was the exact quote. Now government is saying, well, gee, you know, we want to hear what you have to say. But if there's no changes going to be made, what's the point? We've had commitments from Ontario from former Minister of Natural Resources Donna Cansfield in a letter to CSIA as long ago as 2009, promising to consult with stakeholders, us, OFAH, Federation of Ontario Cottage Association, other interests that are included in the stakeholder community, that there'd be conversations and discussion with us, consultation, what we see as what should be a two-way street. As soon as substantive discussion started to move forward with regard to the agreement in principle. That was a promise on behalf of the Ontario government by a cabinet minister. That didn't happen and we reminded Minister Kathleen Wynne, now the Premier, back in 2012 that we had a commitment from Ontario to consult with us. And she wrote back to us months later, many months later, you see the timeline on the slide from January to September, that Ontario was honoring its commitment. Well, that simply is patently false. It's not true. She's been on live radio in Toronto claiming that there have been over 60 consultation meetings with stakeholders. We've been involved in the process. We've been in the room. I've never met Kathleen Wynne. I've never seen her or any of her representatives in the room. But I can tell you that from our standpoint, there's never been 60 meetings about anything that's included the stakeholder community over those 20 years. There were years that went by that there were no meetings with stakeholders. There's no forum for accountable consultation. And by accountable, I mean if you as the public or we as stakeholder community gives input to Ontario or Canada, how do we know how it's used or if in fact it's not used, why wasn't it used? Why wasn't it adopted? It's one thing to listen, it's another to act on the input that's given. It would be our position as the fishing industry that both stakeholders and the public has a right to be heard and a right to be listened to and action taken on behalf of their interests. It's also our view that there has been absolutely no representation of the business interests, the economy, the jobs for either the Algonquin First Nations or for the other rest of the business community that we're part of with regard to recreational fishing and related economies. There's been no representation in this negotiation process of our interests. The Statement of Shared Objectives also talks about the economic opportunities. We've heard many times from all three negotiators that settlement of this land claim would lead to an economic win-win for Eastern Ontario. As part of that, we recommended to Ontario and Canada that there should be a professional review, assess, essentially a market assessment review of the natural resource-based economy in eastern Ontario. Ontario has done this before, back in the 1980s, a program called the Crown Land as a Development Tool Initiative. They reviewed everything from peat extraction to tourism as to the potential in certain areas of Ontario for economic development, for potential. This is standard in any business approach. You take a look at what the market potential is for good or bad. It can prevent people from going down blind alleys and wasting money, wasting time. It can also point out where there's areas where there might be opportunities that have yet been taken advantage of. Any company that's expanding or looking to move into a new area does this as a standard operating procedure. So we recommended that that's something that Ontario and Canada should consider on behalf of all of us, including the Algonquin First Nation people.
But that didn't happen. You hear a lot from government about jobs and economy, how important that is. You hear it from Canada, you hear it from Ontario. They had no interest in this. Ontario said they didn't have the money available. Now I'd remind you that they spent over $20 million on this process. But they didn't have a budget available for an economic market assessment review in direct contradiction to all the claims about an economic win-win. Canada didn't even have the courtesy of responding to our request. We wrote to the federal negotiator back in January 2012 Subsequent reminded them, we were told, well, we're working on it. We never heard a thing. So when you hear all this talk from both Canada and Ontario about the importance of jobs and economy, take a look at the facts, take a look at the actual examples here. There is no mention in the agreement in principle with regard to jobs, economy, economic opportunities for the Algonquins or anyone. No word, no paragraph, no sentence that deals with this in the agreement in principle. Matt talked a little bit about fish and wildlife conservation and those aspects. Pretty important to the background to our business, too. When Minister Cansfield wrote to us back in 2009, she mentioned that there were areas in Canada, other land claim settlements, processes that had taken a look at best practices with regard to fish and wildlife and conservation and so on. And there are. There are several good examples. Several in British Columbia, Yukon, and other places. Here's a couple examples on this slide. They talk about harvest allocation, fair sharing, the management, the conservation, going along with what the Supreme Court has said. My understanding of the Supreme Court rulings on First Nation issues are that they need to be reviewed in the context of the greater Canadian society, not simply with an attention only to the First Nation interests, but conservation as the first priority, and also in consideration of other users, not as a standalone. The way this agreement in principle has been written, it focuses only on the interests of the Algonquins with no attention whatsoever to the other users. There was a lot of input given to the negotiators for both Canada and Ontario in spite of the lack of a formal consultation process with stakeholders. We provided input. The Federation of Anglers and Hunters has done an excellent job with putting information together by some of the best wildlife management professionals in Canada. Retired from the Ministry of Natural Resources, other people, PhD level scientists. They did a first rate job with this. They presented it and weren't waiting for there to be a consultation process. They went ahead and took the initiative themselves. In spite of that input, and it was in writing and it was detailed, none of their input was adopted in the agreement in principle. In spite of what Donna Cansfield wrote and the fact that there are successful examples from other First Nation agreements, they weren't applied either. No reference to other users in fair sharing. We were told by both Canada and Ontario that it wasn't possible to adopt information because other agreements didn't include that. Well, that's not correct either. You might be seeing a pattern evolving here. We're told one thing when in fact something else is true. So what actually happened? If we look at chapter eight in the agreement in principle, and it's an extensive document, and there's a lot of legalese in it, and a lot of escape clauses, a lot of uncertainty, but something that's very clear is what has changed? There are no closed seasons for any species of fish or wildlife with the exception of moose or elk to be determined. There's no bag or creel limits for any species. This applies to Algonquin First Nation people. There's no restrictions on gear or method of harvest. This means that, for example, the Algonquin Park Interior Lakes with the native brook trout population, the largest contiguous native brook trout population left existing in the world, a critical world-class resource. It would be sanctioned after this agreement goes through for anyone who wishes from the Algonquin First Nation to use commercial gear to fish in those lakes, gill nets, trawls, long lines, whatever. There are no restrictions on gear or method of harvest. And as any of you who fish know, with modern technology, modern side scan sonar, 
and a gillnet, for example, it'd be a matter of a couple people could wipe out a lake in a matter of days, if not weeks. Very straightforward. Those are the basics of conservation, yet they've been ignored in this agreement. There's no limit on trade and barter and fishing game. It's supposed to be among First Nation people, but I live near Algonquin Park and fish and game is already being sold there. Has been for years. Much of it coming from within Algonquin Park. And although we're being told that the laws of common application will apply, how can there be law enforcement when there's no rules to enforce? When you set aside all the limits, all the seasons, when it becomes anything goes, any time, by any means, there is no law to enforce. There's no law. There's no conservation. So essentially the agreement sanctions what would now be outlaw behavior. And as you probably realize, if you fish or hunt, most people take their direction from the regulations that the Ministry of Natural Resources publishes every year. Most people aren't fish or wildlife biologists. They figure the ministry knows what they're doing. If they tell you that you can take six bass and that's all you can take for a day, then you take six bass because you assume that the biologists have a reason for doing that. It's based on sound science, based on conservation principles. I think it's fair to say that members of the Algonquin First Nation would look at this and say, well, gee, you know, if the agreement that the ministry has endorsed and that Canada is endorsing says that we can fish and hunt any time and take whatever we wish by any means, that must be okay. I would argue as a wildlife biologist, it's not okay. Matt talked about the history of fish and wildlife management for over a hundred years on the North American continent. The North American model of fish and wildlife management and conservation has served us well. Healthy fish and game populations that are the envy of the world. That happens because there are seasons. There's reasons for seasons. There are limits. There's closures. There's restrictions on gear. There's restrictions on when you can fish and hunt and how you can fish and hunt. There's a reason for that. They're grounded in conservation. Conservation as a principle is not a punchline. Conservation is a sound science-based direction and it's served us all very well. It's served the interest of our economy and business very well. It's important to mention that when this information was first put forward to stakeholders in the summer of 2012. It was an OFAH representative who asked Chief Negotiator Brian Crane, who wrote this? He said, I did. And he added that it was, in subsequent questioning, that it was based on submission from the Algonquins. Now Canada has told us in writing that the Ministry of Environment has been extensively involved, Department of Fisheries and Oceans has been involved in drafting the Harvest Chapter and giving input to it, Parks Canada, Canadian Wildlife Service. The Ministry of Natural Resources has claimed to be involved, yet that's not what the negotiator told us. And if you read this at the end of the day, there are no names attached to this. This is a major policy document in Fish and Wildlife. And someone that was a, a natural resource management professional should be proud to put their name to this if this in fact is based on sound conservation values. No one has done that. And I think what Brian Crane said is probably the actual fact of the matter. It was based on a submission from the Algonquins. So although we're told that Canada has been heavily involved and that the Ministry of Natural Resources has been heavily involved, it doesn't appear to be the case. The allocated species are moose and elk. We, OFAH, other stakeholders have asked for years that there should be species-specific harvest allocations in this agreement, as there are in other agreements, other places, and land claims in the country. One of the important points that we noticed is that going forward, the total allowable harvest allocation of moose and elk is going to be at the discretion of the minister. It's going to be a discussion between the Minister of Natural Resources and the Algonquins. It's the minister's discretion whether the rest of the stakeholders should be included or not. There's no mention of fair sharing in the agreement in principle, and there's no listing of other species. So it just all we have at the end of the day is more economic uncertainty. So what did we get after 20 years, over $20 million? And as far as we can tell, this doesn't include the legal fees which are probably pretty substantial. We have no consideration with jobs and economy for stakeholders, for the public, for the Algonquins, for anyone. There's no accountability. The government has been holding public information sessions and they've called them that. 
Now Canada has been trying to spin it, as has Ontario, as, well, these are also consultations. I would say to you, they're only consultation if there's an accountability metric built into this. If you give input, what's the accountability to know how that's being used? Because at the end of the day, it's often traditional for government to say, well, we heard from a wide range of the public. And so essentially they do whatever they want because they said, well, we heard A, we heard B, we heard C. And so where they go is where they were going in the first place. That's why accountability is so important. To the point I made earlier about some of the great input on fish and wildlife fishing and hunting and conservation that the OFVH did in writing with some great natural resource management professionals providing that input. How is it being used? The evidence to date is that it was completely ignored. So the question remains, how is the public input, how is the stakeholder input going to be accountable? Or is it? That's the key question. All the discussions are in secret. They're all behind closed doors. The other land claims that are overlapping in the region, the Quebec Algonquins, the Williams Treaty, the METI, there are a number of other interests that are overlapping this, leading to more uncertainty. And it's our view that the agreement in principle, fish and wildlife harvest and conservation, literally takes us back to the 19th century, where anything goes long before conservation was ever established on this continent. We don't know how the money's being spent. We don't know how the money's being used. The Algonquins are being told that there's great economic opportunities here. Well, where are they? Where's the evidence? And we had a situation where a commitment from a cabinet minister in Ontario to us in writing was essentially ignored. The negotiators were made aware of it. They've seen the letter. We reminded Kathleen Wynne about it. Nothing. If you can't take a cabinet minister at their word, who can you believe? So when you're being told as the public by Ontario, by Canada, that we're going to listen to what you say, remember what's happened over this 20 year period. I would say the best indicator of future performance is past performance. So show us the facts. How are you going to listen to us? Because they haven't. They haven't even bothered to ask. At the end of the day, as Rick Amsbury, who used to be our executive director, said, we'll get what we settle for and therefore we'll deserve what we get. It's our position in the business community that the only way to go forward is with a fair and honest process and conversation with the public, with stakeholders, with the Algonquin First Nation people. Not behind closed doors, not in secret, a tax paid for process that affects so many people, over 1.4 million non-First Nation residents in the region, belongs in public view. These are public natural resources. The public interest is at stake. Conservation is at stake. Why is it all being discussed behind closed doors? Why, is it, why do we have conservation policy being written by people that are evidently excellent lawyers but have no background in fish or wildlife management credentials? Why is that? The process is seriously flawed. And if you agree, speak up, write, call your elected representatives. We've heard from back from the public meetings that we've all been part of that there are thousands of calls and letters going into members of parliament and members of provincial parliament on this issue. And people are writing themselves, they're calling, they're sending emails, they're speaking out. Because if you don't, we know what we're going to get. We're going to get a flawed process, a flawed result. So don't necessarily just listen to the government spin on this. It's an ad campaign. Take a look at the facts. Look for yourself. Take a look at the website that Matt recommended. It's all right there. If you can read, you can understand it. Don't let the government tell you something that you read and say, well, this is contradictory. Be informed. Be involved. Thank you for paying attention. Our final speaker this evening is Mr. Terry Reese. Terry is the Executive Director of the Federation of Ontario Cottage Associations. Terry? Good evening, and thanks for your attention and your interest in this important issue related to the Algonquin land claim. My name is Terry Reese. I'm the Executive Director of the Federation of Ontario Cottagers Associations and pleased to provide a little bit of background tonight about our interest, about our organization, and about what you can do about this important public policy process. 
For over 50 years, our organization, through our member associations across the province, have taken this mandate very seriously, and that is to protect thriving and sustainable waterfronts across Ontario. We've got a tremendous legacy of waterfronts in this province, and it's up to all of us to ensure that we contribute to public policy that will deliver uh, sustainable waterfronts in the future. We do this through a number of things, through communication, through education and advocacy, speaking to government and speaking to our members about issues that are important to them. We accomplish this goal through a number of things, by encouraging and empowering environmental stewardship amongst individuals across the province, by promoting and providing leadership on public policy and making sure our members are engaged and involved and aligning with key partners to do those things. Through our board of directors, they are volunteers from our member associations from across Ontario. We speak to and for our 500 plus member associations located from Kenora to Cornwall, over 500 associations and 50,000 families. In this area alone, the area of the Algonquin land claim in Eastern Ontario, Waterfront property owners own and steward over 2,000 kilometres and 17,000 acres of important environmentally sensitive lands. That's lands that we all treasure as Ontarians and we take very seriously our role in protecting and managing those for the future. Those landowners own over $10 billion worth of cottage real estate or waterfront real estate and annually pay over $80 million in property taxes. So very vested in the community, very interested in the area and feel very strongly about what happens to this area in the future for their families, their children and grandchildren. So we try to work as an information bridge between policymakers and our members and the Algonquin land claim is a perfect example where FOCA has got a role to speak to government and on behalf of our members and also to make sure our members across the region are informed about these important decisions. In terms of some context, we, uh, as an organization, it's been our long-standing role to coordinate one of the world's largest water quality monitoring programs, so that's making sure we understand the impacts we're having around our lakes, to speak to landowner rights related to other uh, conflicting pieces of legislation, including the Ontario Mining Act. We've worked very closely with the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation and Ministry of Finance about a more open and transparent property taxation system working on land use planning policy on a number of fronts, but including on the provincial policy statements, speaking about strong and informed science through the Fisheries Act and the Experimental Lakes area, and of course, in the context of the Algonquin land claim, as members of the Committee of External Advisors. We, along with OFAH and CSIA, have sat at this stakeholder forum for a number of years, and it's been our experience over the last number of months as things have revved up. Um, this consultation has gotten way ahead of itself and it's our role to make sure that our members understand what's happening and what's been decided on their behalf and make sure that we're in on the conversation. Eastern Ontario is obviously key and very interesting to our interests but we work across the province including working with folks on Lake Winnipeg, which is downstream of some of our largest and most precious Lake of the Woods waters in northwestern Ontario. We work with fire and, other, uh, fire and other rural safety experts to make sure our communities are safe and sound. We work with other NGO communities to talk about how we can have an informed dialogue. We work with our members on cottage succession, how to manage their properties, with the Ministry of Environment on a number of fronts to talk about impacts of waterfronts waterfront properties on our long-standing legacy and natural resources and we speak to the Parliament when we can about issues that impact our members. So our members issues are varied and, and wide but very specifically come back to the sustainability of our communities. So while we work on many issues at many levels of government and encourage our members to do likewise, when it comes to public policy uh, that's specifically going to impact our members. We do try to make sure that our members have an informed opinion and that they speak up uh, whether they're invited or not, frankly, if it's going to impact them. Many of our members may have had the opportunity to enjoy this area when it was virtually undiscovered and we continue to enjoy a legacy in eastern Ontario that's largely undeveloped, low-density, rural type of environments. 
This is part of our natural legacy, part of our economic framework for the region and why people flock to this area, the 1.4 million people that use and live in this area, to continue to, to continue to enjoy it to this day and into the future. It's been our contention that planning around waterfronts is different than planning in urban settings and that overusing or killing the golden goose is not in anyone's interest. So it's important that we take public policy matters related to land use planning very seriously so that we don't overdevelop our waterfronts and end up infringing on important wildlife lands, spawning areas and other natural corridors. So being involved in land use planning and having informed decisions is very important. The Algonquin land claim process is talking about the redeployment of 117,000 plus acres of formerly crown lands throughout the region. We think that that's a matter of major public policy that our members need to understand, that need to be involved in the decisions and need to have open and transparent dialogue from the people making decisions on their behalf. While we don't know what the ultimate disposition and use of these lands will be, hundreds of parcels of land on many lakes across the region, we do want to be part of the process and part of the decision making so we can all enjoy in the future sustainable and thriving communities. It's important, as Matt and Phil have mentioned, that we understand how exactly and how exactly we're affected by the claim or proposed claim and the land selection process. Much of the information that our members need to have is available through the government website, which you can see on this slide, and also through algonquinlandclaim.ca. It's important you understand what lands in your neighborhood are going to be affected and ask some important questions about what the ultimate use of those lands is going to be and how it might impact your use, your, your enjoyment, and the overall context of what happens in your neighborhood, in your community. To get some of this information, armed with the specific information, the parcel numbers from the maps that are available on the website I mentioned, we encourage you to contact the Information Centre about the settlement lands. The contact information is on your screen here. It's important that as a matter of public policy that our elected officials hear from you about what your interests, what your concerns, what your suggestions are. We're going to have good public policy making only when we've got the open and transparent dialogue and input from everyone involved. We've got over a million people in the land claim area, many of whom have lived there for many generations. It's important to have the context and the input from these, these communities and these individuals so that we can all have good decision making. Land use planning happens in a large way at the municipal level of government. It's important that our municipal governments are engaged in this conversation as well. It's important to understand how the parcels that were included as part of the land selection process were included. The municipalities have been part of the decision making process but may or may not entirely understand how those selections were made and what the ultimate use of these lands might be. As a normal part of public policy making around land use planning, it's important that uh, the policy structure around the provincial policy statement, the planning act, local official plans and bylaws are included in any decision that's going to impact the long time, uh, the long standing state of our communities. How will zoning bylaws affect the properties that are, are, have been selected? How will uh, the official plan be amended or will it be? And what will be the permitted uses, density implications, access, etc.? All important issues related to rural lands that our members like to be involved with and that our municipalities need to include as part of a public dialogue. The province has a major stake in this process, obviously, as one of the three parties to the negotiation, so it's important that the Premier and your member of Provincial Parliament understand what your interests are and what your concerns are. So we encourage you to contact these folks. By phone is fine, a letter is great too. But it's important they know that you're interested and that you've got an opinion that's important to consider as part of this process. Through a five meeting series of uh, 
roadshow that we did recently with OFAH and CSIA through the affected area, it became quite apparent that most people that were interested in the area and that had uh, either recreational or property land use issues were largely unaware of this process. It's important that your members of parliament and provincial parliament understand that this is unacceptable and that you'd like to be part of the decision making process. We'd also like to hear from you at FOCA, the Federation of Ontario Cottagers, and you can contact us at info at foca.on.ca to provide your input and please do copy us on your comments to your elected officials. You can read more on our website at foca.on.ca and at the website specifically designed for this process, algonquinlandclaim.ca. You can read more about the land selection process, the declaration order, and the agreement and principle itself. By searching our website, there's important information there related to this Algonquin land claim, about land use planning in general, and about other important issues related to waterfront living. Using our search box is the best way. That's, that'll get you straight to some of the most relevant links. In conclusion, I'd like to thank you for your interest and for watching this webinar and I'd encourage you to continue to stay involved in this important process. It's an important public policy set of decisions that are being made on your behalf. It's going to be long-standing, multi-generational decisions that can only be made better with your participation. That includes speaking up and also letting your elected officials know exactly your feelings about this process, about the decisions being made, about the lands being selected, and about how this will go forward and impact your communities and your families. Thank you for your attention and I appreciate you staying involved and interested. So I'd like to ask the panel, uh, first of all, thank you for your, your presentations this evening. But at the same time, we've had a lot of questions come in uh, from uh, people who are watching this evening and from people at the open houses. And I just want to put some of those questions to you just to get your reactions uh, and, and maybe help people who are watching the webcast uh, go forward with this. The first one is, uh, and I'll maybe uh, start off with Phil on this, Algonquin Park and the world-class brook trout lakes were uh, mentioned in your presentations this evening. Do you know why there is no special attention or restrictions in the agreement in principle with regard to protecting this valuable fishery? No. Uh, the park interior lakes have been closed to winter fishing since 1954 based on pretty solid science at the time that has withstood the test of time. As I mentioned, uh, the brook trout lakes in the interior of the park are the uh, last remaining quantity and quality of brook trout lakes left in the world. And we have for 20 years been asking for there to be a specific fishery management plan put in place with regard to both the brook trout and lake trout lakes within that world-class park, one of the greatest wilderness parks in the face of the world. And yet, in spite of that, after 20 years, there's been no progress with that at all. Ontario m &R has badly dropped the ball on that. Now we're told that there will hopefully be a fish management plan in place by the time the final treaty is signed. I certainly hope they don't get wind burn in their haste to rush forward and accomplish this because after 20 years of not doing so, I'm not sure that we can have a lot of faith in the fact that over the next two, three, four, whatever years before the treaty is finalized, that this will actually happen. I would say it is certainly uh, a huge deficiency in the agreement in principle that this has never been addressed, that the conservation of a world-class resource has been left to drift along and I would say that the Algonquins uh, share blame in that along with Ontario and Canada. They have a responsibility to that resource, as do the rest of us. I think we need to speak up on that behalf. Thanks, Phil. Um, put this to maybe both uh, Phil and Terry. Um, can you explain what role the Committee of External Advisors has played in the uh, agreement and principle process? We keep hearing from the government They've had 63 meetings with the Committee of External Advisors. Isn't this consultation and, and are they right about this? You want to take that one? I can. We've been involved with this uh, process since it began. The Committee of External Advisors was created by Attorney General Charles Harnick back in the Mike Harris government back in, I believe it was 1997 in that period. 
there was a uh, another committee established at the same time for the municipalities in the land claim region, the Municipal Advisory Committee. These committees were put in place to give input and advice uh, to the negotiators on behalf of a wide range of interests. They were comprised of stakeholders, OFAH, CSIA, FOCA, uh, parks and wilderness groups, uh, forest interests, mining, a wide range of uh, diverse stakeholders. The last time there was a provincial minister that participated in any of our discussions, it was Jim Flaherty, not as, not as federal minister of finance, but rather as provincial attorney general. It's been that long since there's been a uh, minister that attended these discussions with us. And although they were, uh, both committees were created to restore transparency and accountability to what had previously not existed under the Bob Ray government, that has gone wanting uh, in the years since the, the Harris era. We were always kept informed as to what the positions of the negotiators were going to be on key issues. We did not know what was being discussed privately at the negotiating table, but those are two separate scenarios. The claims that there have been 63 meetings or whatever the number is that Kathleen Wynne has mentioned uh, in radio interviews and so on, I don't know if they're including walking over the table to pick up a donut during the lunch break, if that qualifies as a meeting, but there have certainly never been 63 meetings. And they aren't what we would consider as consultation. They've essentially been presentations, lecture sessions by government, describing to us uh, decisions already made, or in many cases, very cryptic presentations that don't really provide any information of any consequence. They've largely wasted our time in these sessions and they haven't been forthright, they haven't been accountable. So what is being claimed, uh, Greg, has, in my opinion, simply not true. Well, I understand uh, that in the past, uh, groups like OFAH and CSIA and FOCA and others have presented position papers or given information to the Committee of External Advisors. Do you know what's happened to this advice and this information? Has it been taken to the table? Have the negotiators used it? or has it simply been uh, put aside? Well, based on the evidence and reading the agreement in principle, it's been ignored. And some of the best minds in Canada with regard to fish and wildlife issues, natural resource management and so on have been involved in helping to provide that input. There's been some solid input, I think, uh, on what we've recommended from the jobs and economy, the business standpoint. Uh, I think there's been a lot of good input offered, but from what we see based on the evidence in the agreement in principle, None of it has been accepted. There's been an alternate agenda going on here, in my opinion, and it isn't one that has reflected either the public interest, the interest of conservation, or the interest of business and jobs and economy. Terry, would you agree with that? I think that's true. Not much of what's, there hasn't been much two-way dialogue, frankly, as Phil says, and as certainly the agreement in principle when it was released was, uh, all, was basically all news to all of us, I think. So the Committee of External Advisors is mostly a list, as far as we can tell, versus a set of people who would have were asked uh, for their advice and whose advice was then incorporated into the agreement. So it's a lost opportunity, really. Um, this next question, maybe I'll, I'll throw it to Matt, but any one of you can uh, jump in if you'd like. Um, Matt, is there any indication uh, thus far from what you know and from what the public's been told about what the Algonquins might be planning uh, the, to use the Crown lands uh, for that will be transferred to their ownership and control uh, uh, down the road? Well, that's a really important question, Greg, and I think that that's going to really influence what happens with these lands and the future of the natural resources on these lands, the use of those lands by the public, and the use of the adjacent lands surrounding the lands that are being transferred to the Algonquins of Ontario. And as we all know, there's 200 parcels, and each one of those parcels has been selected for a reason. The Algonquins of Ontario were involved in that land selection process, and there is a reason, and we know that a large percentage of those lands that are being, tra that are being transferred are going to be developed. We don't necessarily know exactly how they're gonna be developed or what that's gonna look like. We don't know how that's gonna impact not only our use of existing roads, existing trails, uh, or how it may impact some of the designated lake trout lakes, which we know are very sensitive to development. We don't know what it's gonna mean for our ability to access roads, boat launches, some of those critical access points for surrounding crown lands. 
We don't know if there's going to be development of renewable energy. We don't know if there's going to be uh, construction uh, of, uh, of the lo uh, like lots that are going to be uh, used for development of houses, of residences, of uh, any sort of bu buildings and what that'll mean. We don't know specifically what's going to happen, but those are important questions that those of you who are impacted by some of these transfers of the parcels of lands that will go to the Algonquins of Ontario, you need to ask. You need to ask municipalities what discussions they've had. You need to ask the, your, uh, lo your local MPs and MPPs. You need to ask those questions of the negotiators. What are the intentions of the Algonquins of Ontario once those lands are transferred? Because we know that people are going to be displaced by the land transfers themselves. That the way we use those lands will fundamentally change. But we may not only be impacted by what's going to happen now, but what will happen in the future as those lands are developed by the Algonquins of Ontario, depending on what use they have decided for those lands. Well, Matt, you addressed, uh, you raised an important point there when you, when you used the term displaced. Uh, even though there's, there's supposed to be no expropriation of private lands, uh, except on a willing buyer, willing seller basis as part of this, uh, the government has claimed that no one will be displaced. So this is really a two-part question. Number one, is it true? And number two, uh, is there an example, uh, like for instance, the provincial park that's being created here, how is that possible that nobody will be displaced by the creation of something like that? Anybody? Well, maybe I could address the first part of the question about displacement, and then uh, I could pass it over to maybe Terry, you can take the second part of the question. As I referred to in my presentation and in the answer to the last question, is that there's go people will be displaced. When you have the transfer of 117,000 acres, more than 117,000, and you also have the change of land use designations from Crown Land to Provincial Park, and some of the other uh, lands that the Algonquins are interested in that aren't specifically mentioned within the agreement of principle, that people will be displaced. People use those lands right now. They use them, they hunt there, they fish, they kayak, they canoe, they camp, they cottage. They use those lands in a number of ways. If those lands are transferred from public lands to private lands, they will be displaced from those lands. And even if it's not just the way they use them, it's also the access to those lands, the access to adjacent lands, there will be people who are going to be displaced from the current public lands. Yeah, that's right, Matt, and I think it's true that in the AIP, they're quite explicit about the fact that expropriation is not part of this, so if you have private lands, uh, these are not going to be lands that are, that are subject to the uh, selection process. But there's clearly examples like around Crotch Lake where there's a large uh, chunk of land where there's, uh, which includes uh, private landowners within the uh, lands that are selected. Uh, some of these people, and that's not the only example, but some of these private parcels are going to continue to require access over what were formerly crown lands and are now going to be subject to this uh, land uh, selection process. It begs some questions for us about how the private landowning interests in that area specifically are going to continue to be able to use the access to that area, for instance, uh, in the... Uh, under the current scenario where those lands will be transferred. Those are questions that we frankly don't know the answer to, and I think it's something that needs to be asked of the government. Phil, you, uh, you, uh, you know, have talked about jobs and economy. That uh, Crotch Lake uh, Provincial Park that's being created, uh, those, uh, those lakes, uh, in addition to the private cottagers that, that own property on those lakes, there's also at least one or two fairly major lodges or, or tourist operations on those lakes, how will they be impacted? Well, you know, that's an unknown. We have seen in other land claim settlements in Ontario where tourism uh, lodges, although the land that the lodge was on was not expropriated, access to the land was restricted and the people lost their family business. And so expropriation can happen by a number of means. It's not simply taking the land that your business sits on. If you choke off people's access to it, then you have the same net effect. You starve the business. How that will happen in this case, we don't know. Uh, there's a lot of verbal assurances that this won't be the case, but I would say if it's not written in stone in the agreement, clear black and white, then it in fact doesn't exist. 
And so how that is to shake out at the end, Greg, is yet to be determined. But uh, I know one of the questions we had at one of the uh, public meetings that we conducted was from a member of the audience, and he asked what the reason was that the Algonquins wanted to own pieces of what are now Crown lands. And when I spoke to that point, I said, I don't know what their reason is. That would be up to them to answer. But if I was going to buy a piece of land, for example, it wouldn't be because I wanted to share it with everybody else who wanted to use it. So I expect they have some intent in place to uh, control access, restrict access, whatever, because it will be their private land. The details are as yet unclear. Something that's important here, I think, is that we have heard for years from Canada, from Ontario, that this agreement in principle and the final treaty will lead to finality and certainty. Well, it's anything but final or certain. And these types of questions are just being punted down the road for somebody else to look after. You know, we look at this as uh, what has been accomplished in these negotiations. I would argue that the negotiators haven't negotiated anything. There was supposed to be a give and a get. Well, there's been a lot of give. Well, where's the get? All of this is somewhere else, somebody else's problem punted down the road. You know, I think they've done a pitiful job putting this together. And I think that Phil's touched on an important point there in talking about uncertainty. Uh, we talked about a fisheries management plan that may come down the road. We've talked about uh, a lot of things within the agreement in principle that may come in the final agreement or that are supposed to come in the final agreement. So when we talk about the agreement in principle, we know what's written there, but we don't necessarily know what's going to be decided about those specific points within the agreement in principle. And the fisheries management plan is a good example is that there's a lot of uncertainty still, even though we have a document and it's a comprehensive and complicated document, that there's still a lot more to come out of that document and what it actually means. And we're living with that uncertainty right now, not knowing what's going to happen in the future. Well, you know, the, the negotiators have become uh, public advocates for their own work. And uh, to that point, uh, the lack of a fishery management plan in Algonquin Park I mean, this isn't hard to do. It's been done by the Ministry of Natural Resources for decades. Yet they have failed to do so in this example. Why is that? We keep hearing platitudes and hyperbole about how important conservation is, how important the resource is, fish and wildlife and all that. But there's no evidence that anyone is acting on those claims. In fact, the contrary is true. So how important can they be when the evidence shows that there's been no attention to it? If Algonquin Park doesn't matter, as a world-class park, and the last remaining brook trout fishery of its quantity and quality in the world isn't important enough to have some attention to it over 20 years, what is conservation? I would challenge all the negotiators to answer that question. Show me the facts. Show me the evidence. And the devil will be in the details, in that a management plan, a fisheries management plan, in principle, is a really good idea. We'd like to see a management plan that's going to tell us how the resource will be managed as a whole. But until we know what that management plan says, how can we support that? And how can we just support the idea of doing that? We need to know what that management plan is going to mean for the fisheries. You know, these are bright people that have negotiated this. They're intelligent, well-educated. I would say that there must be an answer to the question, what would the reason be for avoiding addressing these issues? People usually do things for a reason, or they don't do things for a reason. What would the reason be? That's a good question. Um, I'll move on to our last question for the panel here today uh, before our time is up. And maybe I'll uh, point this one in Terry's direction uh, to, to start with. We've heard a lot about these uh, subject lands that have been selected, the, the 200 plus parcels that the Algonquin have chosen, um, and the fact that there will be no less than 117,500 acres part of this. Um, many of these lie within municipal boundaries. And we know that municipalities across eastern Ontario are trying to grapple with what does this mean for them in terms of things like zoning bylaws, property taxes, development fees, and whatnot. Can you speak to that at all, Terry? Sure. Uh, the land use planning process in Ontario is imperfect, but it's a process that we've come to use to ensure that we develop our communities in a way that makes sense, that we have the right kind of infrastructure in place, that we consider existing users and uh, property taxpayers, commercial interests, residents, industry, etc. So when you're talking about the repurposing of a large swath of lands and implicating most of the municipalities in the, all of the municipalities in the Algonquin land claim area, uh, we have many questions that remain related to how these lands will be <clears throat> They're going to be turned into patent lands. They'll be, they'll be private lands, no longer 
subject to the uh, to the uh, the crown to the province's uh, interests and responsibilities. So these will be private lands. Part of it, the claim has been related to providing economic ac activity. So as Phil says, it's our expectation that some of these lands, most of these lands, are going to be used in some active and, and commercial perspective where people can, can uh, make best use of these properties, which is all well and fine provided it's in the context of a community plan and the infrastructure that's there and understanding that it relates to other taxpayers. We don't know when these properties are going to be subject to property tax, although that language is in there. There's some indication that once they're developed, they'll be subject to, to municipal property tax, in which case there's some benefit to the local communities, but how and, how and when that happens, what the zoning process will be like, and how those newly private and available for development lands will be <clears throat> incorporated into existing official plans and zoning bylaws are all good questions. We don't think the municipalities that are implicated know all the answers, but that's certainly a question for them because as they're on a the map, they have to now ascertain how that relates to their existing lands, their infrastructure, the roads and access, waste management, sewage, and other related municipal services. So it's going to impact the municipalities in the area, and uh, those are uh, all questions that, as far as we're concerned, are still open and up in the air. I don't know if you had any, anything to add. Well, I was just going to uh, say, Terry, that uh, I, I agree with all of that. And what we seem to uh, have happening here is a, is a whole new layer of bureaucracy, another whole tier being created, whether it's with regard to fish and wildlife management, parks, uh, land use, planning, uh, a layer of First Nation management, if you will, involvement on top of what already exists. And whether that is actually what occurs at the end of the day, I'm not certain, but that seems to be where things are trending. And if that's so, then in an era of budget cuts and uh, restraints on municipal funding, provincial funding, federal funding, I'm not sure how that's all going to be paid for or how that will work in a matter of efficiency but it, it appears that we have bureaucrats creating more bureaucracy. Just before we run out of time, I guess the one last question would be that a lot of people have been asking at the public meetings and, and through phone calls and letters is what's the next step here? The agreement in principle was released. Well, where does this go from here? Any one of you? We, sorry, I'm just going to say we keep hearing different messages. You know, and that's one of the problems in this, in this process. There's been a revolving door of federal negotiators especially, uh, which is part of the confusion. But what has not been confusing is what we're told in the stakeholder meetings and then what the public is hearing. And it's not the same thing. As I mentioned in my presentation, Ontario's Chief Negotiator Brian Crane made it clear at the, in answer to a question from the floor actually, at a uh, stakeholder meeting on the harvest chapter of the agreement last summer in 2012, that once the agreement in principle was made public, which it was back in December, that there would be little, if any, opportunity for uh, change or adjustment to it. Uh, he also commented that, and someone followed up and said, well, then how are we supposed to be affecting any of this? He said, well, you can exert enormous political pressure to affect change. So I would suggest that he was encouraging all of us and the public to do that. And so I would take Brian at his word and suggest that people should be definitely calling their MPs and members of Parliament uh, provincially. But I think we uh, are seeing very clearly here that in many cases, when there's pressure, attention from the public, then what we're being told by government is changing. Now we're hearing that, well, we can adjust the agreement in principle. Well, which is it? Is it what Brian said or is it what they're saying now a few months later? So the answer to your question, or to the public's question that they put forward, Greg, is it's really hard to tell because it's a constantly moving target and it goes to the integrity and accountability of the whole process. It's been a problem for a long time, for many years, and it continues to be a problem. They tell us A, but in fact it's B. They come out with political spin. It's pure political theater and advertising in some of the things that we're hearing now that the governments are putting out. You know, when you, they figure, I think, that uh, most people won't bother to read the details in the agreement, which is why what we've been trying to do is, I think, so important to tell people the rest of the story. Matt, did you have any comment there? Well, I think what I would say, just to, to echo Phil's comments, is that 
we have to remember that this is a settled landscape. This region has been settled for hundreds of years and there are deep rooted traditions of non-Algonquins as well as Algonquins. And that these people, they live, they work, they recreate within these communities. They use these lands that are being transferred. They are going to be impacted on. So don't wait for the government to ask the questions. As Phil said, it's a revolving door. We don't know what questions are gonna be asked if they're ever gonna be asked. It's gonna be up to the public to go to their elected officials and to say, this is how we're affected and we want to see changes. And that's the only thing we can do at this point is that we need to make our voice heard. Collectively, we need to come together and all make our voices heard. That's the important thing. I would suggest the public should be asking for a process of integrity and accountability to be created because it surely doesn't exist now. With that, good things can happen. Without it, we have the gong show that we've been dealing with now for years. It's a mess. Yeah, well, when the agreement in principle was released last December, the initial reaction of at least one Algonquin chief was, this is a good start, but it's only a start. And we've heard from Mr. Potts, the chief uh, negotiator for the Algonquin, that there are still 30 or more issues still to be negotiated before uh, an, a, a final agreement in principle is signed off on by all three parties, which from what we understand might be sometime this fall. Is this realistic, this timetable, given how long it's taken to get to this point in time? And, and should people be concerned about what else is now being negotiated behind closed doors? I might just start if I could, um, and I'll turn it over to you. But the, this process, as Phil says, should have been a dialogue right from the, from the get-go. There's hundreds of different interests in this area. It's a settled landscape, and the Algonquin, by the sounds of it, need to have a more fulsome and uh, robust way to, to give input to it as well. Certainly the interest of everyone on the sta external stakeholders committee have felt like they haven't had an opportunity to weigh in on the decisions that we've been told have been already made and the constituents that we represent I think all have an interest in having a more active role in making these decisions, uh, you know, making putting our input in so that the decisions are better and that we can end up with a better product. So I might turn it over to you. I, I think that's true. Uh, and you know, the, I think the, the fatal flaw here is that without knowing what the public interest is, without knowing what the business interests and concerns might be, how can the negotiators for Ontario and Canada represent any of those interests? I would say that they can't. At best, they're guessing. At worst, they're paying no attention. Matt, any final words? No, it's just to, it would be to reiterate what's already been said, that we have gone through this process for 20 years, and through that time, on our behalf, the Ontario government, the federal government, they've been negotiating for us. And if we haven't been consulted during that time, what have they taken to the table? So we need to know what was taken to the table, but we also need to make our voices heard. We need to get out there and tell them how we're impacted, how we're affected by this land claim. Thank you all three of you. It's been very instructive and we hope that the folks turning in, uh, tuning in this evening have learned a bit about the land claim and understand the fact that they need to speak up, they need to understand more about this, and they need to talk to their local politicians and make their views known if they're going to affect the outcome of this. So thank you all three of you. Once again, let me thank you for joining us this evening for this webcast. I hope that throughout this uh, broadcast you've gained some information and some insight about what the Algonquin land claim is all about and a little bit of understanding about what kind of issues are at play here and what kind of impacts this could have on your lives going forward. We invite you to let us know your concerns and your questions. We invite you to look at the material that's on the website, in particular to fill out any of the forms that are there and send them in so that we understand how it is that this land claim will impact upon you. But finally, the most important message is you need to talk to your provincial and your federal representatives and let them know what your concerns are and the fact that the public has not been consulted in this issue and far too much is at stake without having those serious public consultations before this issue moves forward in any way. Thank you again for joining us. We look forward to continuing to keep you updated as this issue progresses.